Grab your Bibles and let's go to the Word of God. Thank you, musicians. We're good. Thank you all. Amen. Grab your Bibles and um, let's go to the Word and allow God just to move and have his way in our midst. I just want to encourage you this morning. I won't be before you long. Um, all week as I've been seeking the Lord, um, you know, sometimes God takes you to, word, to the Word and sometimes God gets you like, deep and engrossed in it. So I think the Lord just kind of more ministered to me this week. And I just want to kind of share just uh, four simple things with you to encourage you and to remind you of the truth that prayer changes things. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, prayer changes things. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, prayer changes things. Amen. Do y'all believe that today? Y'all believe that? Here's something else I, I also believe. I believe that there's power in a praying church. I believe that. I believe there's power in a praying church. And we've been on the series of prayer for quite some time. And um, we're probably going to hang out here just a little bit longer. The Lord hasn't quite yet released me from that. But I want to look at a passage in the book of Acts. Go with me to Acts chapter 12. Um, interesting passage of scripture there that I want to share some things with you to hopefully encourage you and encourage us all as we encourage myself to be who God would have us to be. So I want to just uh, invite you to open up the Word of God. Um, let's look there, let's read, and let's allow God to, to move and have his way in our midst. Let me read this in its entirety um, so you can at least get a vision of what we're going to say, and then we'll talk about it as we kind of walk through just a section of a time at a time just to share these four simple things with you that I want you to take away so we can be who God would have us to be. If you're in verse 1, say amen. Amen. Give, give, give an ear to the word of God. Um, the Lord just laid on my heart to read this. Now about that time, Herod the king lay violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. That was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Oh, somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. My goodness, there's something there. Come on, say, Follow God. And he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. And when he had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them um, of its own accord. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. Look at verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Prayer changes things. Come on, y'all. There's power in a praying church. Y'all fool me. Come on, just say it again. Say, prayer changes things. And say, self, there's power in a praying church. Amen. I don't want to be before you long. We're going to pick this up on Wednesday and go a little deeper into it. But I just want to share just briefly the things that God is starting to show me. And he's continually unveiling it to me about this passage. Here's what you need to know about where of literary context, right? We're in the book of Acts. And as we're in Acts, the church is growing. You know that was the onset of the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the earth realm. The Holy Spirit had come. It had empowered the believers, and the believers were no longer complacent. They were doing what God had called them to do by way of evangelizing, by way of seeking the lost, by way of going about and bringing people into a relationship with God. And what's interesting about what was happening in Acts in that particular time frame is that the church was growing. Come on, y'all. People were getting saved. 
saved. Come on. People were being delivered. The miraculous were happening in that day and age within the church. Now, does anybody know that when God starts to do a move within culture, move within community, the community, the enemy is not going to sit down and say, go ahead, church. Does anybody know that he's going to intervene and try to disrupt what God is doing? And the same is true in my life and the same is true in your life. Whenever you set out to do what God has called you to do, don't make the mistake into thinking you're going to sit by and it's going to be all right. Because the moment you step out into destiny to do what God called you to do, I'm trying to tell you all the enemy is going to show up. Are you with me? He's going to show up. He's going to show up. But don't let that deter you because I want you to hear me say today that prayer changes things. So here's what I want you all to lock into by way of a big idea is that when we engage God in earnest prayer, he acts on our behalf. That's the good news. Are you with me? That when we engage God in earnest prayer, God acts on our behalf. So when you look at the text that's in front of us, in verses 1 through 4, it opens up by saying, About that time that Herod, the king, had laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So here's what was happening. Prophecy was going forth. It has been prophesied that a famine was about to hit the church. And Barnabas and Saul went down now to Jerusalem to take goods to help with the relief efforts so the people of God could be good. In other words, ministry was happening. There is no other way to say it, but God was doing the miraculous in the earth realm. And while that was going on, verse 12 picks up and opens up by saying that Herod the king, here's what he's doing. He's going about trying to stop what God wants done. He places violent hands on some who belong to the church. And look at verse 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Here's what was going on in that day and age. There was a lot of beheading that was going on. So when a person named the name of God and they stepped out in boldness, your life was at stake. What's striking about that, we have freedoms today. We have liberties. Come on. And back then, these people knew that if they named the name of God, they risked being decapitated, but it didn't stop them. Lord, have mercy. I have to ask myself, what's my problem? Are you with me? I've got constitutional laws that said I've got freedom of speech, but yet I'm afraid to name the name of God. What is my problem? Oh, my goodness. So, so, so James, the brother of John, was killed with the sword. And, and, and lock, watch, what, watch what the king is doing, Herod's doing. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And then it says, interestingly, this was during the, the, the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? And then look at verse 4. And when he had seized him, this is Peter now, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. And verse 5 says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Here's the first thing I want you to take away as we talk this morning. Number one, I want you to understand that when I say prayer changes things, you must get this in your spirit. Prayer frustrates the intentions of the enemies against us. Y'all too cool. Y'all too cool. Y'all too cool. Maybe, maybe you just like drama. Maybe you just like the enemy chasing you. You can't get what I'm saying? Maybe you just like him interrupting what God wants done through you. But I want you to hear me say this morning that, that prayer frustrates the intentions of the enemy against us. You got to lock into this, right? Here's what the text says. That the disciples were going about doing their ministry. They were doing what God had called them to do. They were ministering. They were having impact. The church was growing. People were being brought to a relationship with God. Interestingly enough, Pharaoh, I mean, Herod comes on the scene and he's starting to kill the leadership of the church to prevent the word from being propagated. He gets a hold of John, right? 
I mean, James, the brother of John. And he kills him with the sword that he says, next, I'm going to go after Peter because if I can get to Peter and if I can kill him, I think I can stop this work from going on. Right? But, but the text says, the text says in verse 5, look at verse 5. It says, earnest prayer. Oh, I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to creep. I'm saying earnest prayer. You see, you've got to understand the reason they had this prayer going on because a long time it had been commonplace and there were no miracles happening. They hadn't seen the move of God and all of a sudden people that were sick were getting healed. Come on, families were being restored. Family values were being placed into the families again. The miraculous, God, uh, the miraculous move of God was happening in the culture. The church was not satisfied with that ending. So when I say earnest prayer, I'm led to believe, Sister Pat, that when they said prayer meeting on, on Wednesday night, it, people didn't stay home and watch TV. Yeah, yeah, y'all got to get this. Y'all got to get this. Prayer was a priority. There was a desperation. There was a hunger. Come on. There was a, a press and a need to encounter God, to feel God, to have the right now of God in the presence. So I want you to get a visual. You think it was just 120 up in the, in the upper room. You've got to put this in your framework. At the first message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, about 3,000 people got saved. So I want you to see a multitude of people crying out to God. And then I'm reminded of the scripture. If one can put, you know, <laughs> imagine what about 5,000 can do. When I'm trying to get you to understand that prayer frustrates the intentions of the enemy, I'm willing to, to say that when we read this story, and if the enemy were to open a Bible and read it, he'd say to you, I didn't expect that to happen. Because I killed John real easy. But then when I got to Peter, it was tough. You see, the problem with that is that the enemy had forgot where Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, upon this rock I'll build. And the what? Y'all know it. Y'all know it. So you mean even though he had him in, y'all not getting this, come on. You mean even though he had him in prison, when the church is mobilized in prayer, even the gates of hell can't conquer the people of God that's crying out to God in prayer. Now, I know when, when, when Jesus made that scripture, he was saying contextually that the faith that P Peter exemplified, but in this season, Peter played a critical role because notice the text says James was, was crucified or, or killed, but Peter was remained alive. Let me, let me, let me help you all get this because I want to encourage you this morning. Here's what Jesus said, before I formed you in the womb, I yeah, y'all know it. Come on, y'all know it. And I knew you, and I ordained you to be what a prophet to the nations. And then I love this passage in Isaiah that says this: as the as the dew falls from the heaven, and it comes to the earth, and it does not return without first watering the earth and making it bloom and blossom. Listen to this: so is my word. It cannot return to me, what, void, unless it, what, accomplishes that which I sent it to. Y'all got to get this. The reason James died is because he had accomplished, yeah. And the reason Peter couldn't die, I wish I had somebody in here, because God hadn't done, wasn't done with him yet. That text drives home the truth that you are here because God isn't done with you yet. Come on. And if you want to get the enemy off your back, we've got to engage the church of God in the power of prayer because it frustrates the intentions of the enemy. Because you're here and God isn't done with you yet doesn't mean that the enemy won't pursue you. Are you hearing me? It doesn't mean he won't come, but if you want to slow him down, if you want to get him off your back, I'm trying to say we've got to engage the church, engage God. Are you hearing me in earnest prayer? I like this because you've heard me say this before and I'm going to say it again. The reason that car accident didn't take you out is because somebody was praying for you. 
Are you hearing me? The reason that sickness hadn't taken you out is because what? Somebody, yeah, you get it. The reason, the reason, the reason that divorce didn't end your, 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 your life or your situation is because somebody was praying for you. And the better part of what I want you to hear me say is that God is not finished with you yet. There is work to do. So if I'm you and, and, and the enemy is being frustrated because he can't take me out yet, my prayer to God is, God, what do you want me to do? Come on, are you hearing me? God, why am I here? So lock into this, y'all. Repeat of me. Say, self, when I pray, I frustrate the enemy's intention against me. Y'all don't believe me. Get mad with somebody. You heard about forgiveness last week, right? Go to God in prayer. Listen to what God says. He frustrates the enemy. After that, the issue is not the enemy. It's you and I disobeying God. Y'all get it? Second thing, let me move quick. Prayer enables us to have peace. In the midst of calamity. Y'all get this? It enables us to have peace in the midst of calamity. Look at, look at, look at this. It says here, verse 6, when Herod was about to Bring him out. On that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. I know, I know this don't mean nothing to you. But, but understand, he had just seen his colleague got beheaded. Him being captured, all signs said, you're next. The record says that the king said, Herod said, I'm going to respect Jewish tradition and I'll wait until after the Feast of Unleavened Bread is over, the seven-day feast, or I'm going to wait till after Passover and I'm going to bring you out and I'll deal with you. Now, day one, he might have been all right. Day two, he might get a little bit of butterflies. I'm telling you, by the time day seven come, if I'm him and it's you, ain't nobody getting no sleep. I've never been on death row, and I know you've never been on death row because I'm looking at you. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure if you know the date and time of your execution has been stated, the last thing you're doing is sleeping the day before that's supposed to happen. Verse 5 said, but the church was praying what? Yeah, y'all know it. Y'all get it. Y'all get it. Y'all get it. And so here's what it says. Prayer enables. I mean, you got to lock into this. This guy is bound. I mean, with chain between two guards. He's shackled. And, and these guards are there. And guards are standing in front of him to keep 24-7 watch, right? There are sentries at the gate. There is no getting out. But the text says he is asleep the day before his execution. Right? I'm telling you, when the Bible says cast all your cares, all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If you are a warrior, you are, that's W-O-R-I-E-R, -E you ought to try praying. Come on. If you're a person that can't get no rest, that's always concerned about what's going to happen, you ought to try praying praying. Come on. Here's what he says. Look at the lilies. They don't toil. They don't labor, but your heavenly father takes care of them. Something about Peter gave him the assurance that God was going to take care of him. And I'm crazy enough to believe while he was praying, the church was praying and he was not concerned about outcome. This is for your information. James has just been killed. A couple of chapters earlier, Stephen was killed. You kind of get what I'm saying? So I don't know that their prayer was, Lord, preserve his life. But they were saying, God, do something. Because the record had shown 
that when the king got you, death was imminent. Are you hearing me? This is why it's important for you to understand the peace that I shed for you in the first point. That the enemy can't take you out when God isn't through with it, with you yet. The problem is you don't know that. And the only way you find that out is by praying and allowing God to move after you prayed. He was peaceful. Pastor D, he was peaceful. Pastor Topaz, peaceful. Here's what this says to me. Felix, if you find yourself worried about a lot of stuff, you might want to check your prayer life. Because if this brother could be facing death and cry out to God in prayer, you guys get this. Come on, let me move, let me move, let me move. Look at the third thing. Look at the third thing. I like this. Prayer, not only does it provide peace, but it does provide what? Oh, my goodness. Y'all just say deliverance. Come on, say it again. Say deliverance. Hear, Hear me say this. Hear me say this. I, when we were in James, I said to you, in James 5, the prayer mixed with, with faith will raise you up, right? So he's praying. Watch this. And while the church is praying, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in his cell. Now, look at the next phrase. He struck Peter on the side. And woke him, saying, get up quickly. Now, now, don't, don't make the mistake. The, 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 the Greek, how, how that word struck is translated, Peter was asleep. And, 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 and if he were some of us, <laughs> he's getting it in. Are you with me? He, he, he was getting it in. So the angel didn't just show up and say, hey, Peter, wake up. Hey, Peter, wake up. Get up, get up. No, no, no. That word struck sounds like this. Get up. He hit him. Are you with me? He hit him and he woke him up in the middle of the calamity that he found himself in. Right? Now the reason I want to emphasize that, the reason I want to emphasize that is because some of us are asleep but we're woke. And we're stuck in the calamity. And we don't know how to get out of it. And sometimes God comes and he dispatches an angel and the angel strikes you and says, get up. But because your prayer life ain't been in order, you can't recognize the voice. I wish I had somebody in here to wake up and start listening to what God is saying. Some of y'all don't believe me. You ain't been acting right and you found yourself in a crisis. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a something and you got out of it and you're saying, I don't deserve to be out of this. Well, sure enough, you don't recognize the reason it turned is because the angel of God struck you and said, wake up. And what we do next dictates deliverance. What we do next dictate deliverance. Because some of us wake up, look around, oh, it's still the same. And we go back to sleep in the storm. Are you hearing me? Uh, we don't have time to flesh this out. We don't have time for, watch this. Wake up, he says. He struck him on the side. Get up quickly. And then it says, and because he woke up, the chains fell off. Because he woke up, the chains fell off. Y'all see that? You kind of get what I'm saying? If he had stayed asleep, ain't no need in the chains coming off because he wasn't going nowhere no how. Are you hearing me? But because he was obedient to the voice of God, he woke up, the chains fell off, right? Now, mind you, chains falling off, there's a clanging sound associated with chains being fallen. You kind of get what I'm saying? I'm still trying to figure out how in the heck these guards that he was chained to didn't hear the knock to wake up and didn't hear the chains falling in the first place. But I'm trying to tell you when God is intervening, here's the first thing I said, he frustrates the plans of the enemy. Come on. He'll blind his eyes. He'll cover his ears. Come on. He'll pervert. Are you weird? weird? But the issue is we've got to wake up. You got to get up. 
The chains fell off, and the angel said to him, dress yourself. <laughs> Excuse me. Take off the prison clothes and put on the garments. If any man is in Christ, he's what? The old has what? Yeah, and the new has what? So when God wakes you up, you got to take some things off. Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. I'm trying to help you get to deliverance. Does this make sense? You've got to take some things off. Are you hearing me? Come on, say, take it off. Take it off. Say it again. Say, take it off. So watch what he says. Get yourself dressed and put on your sandals. And I love this phrase. And he did so. And he did so. And then he said to him, wrap your cloak around you. And then I love this. And do what? Don't stop there. But then verse 9 says, and he went out and followed him. The Greek word for salvation is the word sotso. And here's what that word implies or says. Whom the Son therefore has set free. Y'all know it? Really? So then why, why is it that I've been saved for 40 years and I still got the same struggles that I had 40 years ago when I got it seems to me if those struggles are still there, when the angel came and said, wake up, I said, man, I hear you, but I'm tired. And I went back to sleep, and the change never came off. <laughs> are you hearing me? And so I'm serving the Lord, but I'm dragging guards with me because I'm still in bondage. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on. I've got the prison following me, and I come to church. Y'all can't see the prison because you look at the outward appearance, and God looks at the heart, and he can see that I'm still bound. I got saved, but I chose not to wake up. And then more importantly, I chose not to take off the old and get dressed and look at the next verse and follow Christ. And follow Christ. And follow Christ. If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Take up his cross. So it seems to me deliverance is expressively stated in the text. Prayer frustrates the plan of the enemy. It gives me peace in the midst of the storm. Then it provides deliverance. But this deliverance is only available if I take it. So when prayer is offered on my behalf... Here's what we want to happen. We want God to literally come and hold our hand, Sister Annette, and take his key from the shackles and unlock it and so on and so forth. No, no, he did that on Calvary. So the moment you come to him and you say, yes, Lord, and you get up, it's a default state that shackles will fall. I wish I had somebody in here. It's a default state that it's going to happen. The problem is don't stay in the prison cell. You've got to follow God. Oh, talk to me this morning. You've got to follow him out of it to receive your deliverance. Now look at the text. 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 We don't have time to go through all of this. And he went out and followed him. Turn to the neighbor and say, neighbor, prayer changes things. But you've got to change some things. <laughs> Y'all getting this? Y'all get this? You get it, right? So if, if your thing is the little store with the green leaf, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. That's legal in Colorado. Let me use a different example. Even if it is, amen? Whatever your chain is, when you cry out to God in prayer and he shows up, the chains have been off. Don't allow Herod to catch you again and put him back on. Let me press, let me press, let me press. He followed him and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. Y'all get this? Ah, oh, Jesus, we ain't got enough time. We need, we need. He didn't know what was being done by the angel was real. One more time. Y'all ain't get it yet. He did not know what was being done by the angel, Elder John, was real. So here's what we do. We're struck on alcohol, drugs, pornography, whatever. And we come to the altar and they pray. And they say, you've been set free. Here's what you say. You did not know 
what was going on was real. So you say, I don't feel no different. <laughs> Y'all get this? It's real. But you got to follow the angel out of the prison cell. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Where did I stop? He thought he was seeing a vision, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Look at verse 10. And when he had passed the first gate and the second guard, when the first, first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city, and it opened for them how? When God delivers you, <laughs> I'm talking about doors being open that were closed, that there's nothing you could have done to open it before. Y'all not hearing me. Are you with me? By its own self, had nothing to do with you and who you are. When I say prayer changes things, let me keep going, let me keep going. And they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel left him. Okay, this is free. There's a season in the infancy of your deliverance where God will have his angels to walk with you. There's a period in the journey when you ought to be able to walk by yourself. The point of all of that is you've got to walk. You can't stand still and expect God to walk with you. That's not walking. That's laying in the prison cell. If you want prayer to work, there's action involved with it. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me wrap this up. Look at the last thing real quick, right? Here's the last thing I want you all to take away. Prayer reminds us of the truth that God is one. Does this make sense? The truth that God is on your side. Number one, I said prayer thwarts the enemy's intentions and plans. Number two, I said it gives you peace in the midst of calamity. Remember that? Number three, it gives you deliverance, right? And here's number four. It reminds you that God is on your side. Now, the interesting thing about that, I know I said it fourthly, but even when the enemy is chasing you, God is still. Yeah. You get it? So watch the text. Watch the text, and I'm done. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expected. Church, hear me say this. Prayer changes things. Subtitle is power in a praying church. It took Peter walking through the experience that he did to really see God and understand God at a completely different level. Here's what I'll say to you. You can't call God a healer experientially until you've been healed. On the backside of being healed, no demon in hell can convince you of the fact that God does not heal. Y'all not hearing me. You can't call God provider until you haven't had a job and he took care of you without income. On the other side of provision, no demon in hell can convince you of the truth that he is not a provider. Are you hearing me? You can't call God peace until you've been through a storm. Are you hearing me? Then on the other side of the storm, no demon in hell could convince you of the truth that God is not peace or shalom in the midst of the storm. I, I want you all to hear me say that. Prayer changes things. And until you engage God in the power of prayer and get up and start to walk out the things that God wants you to walk out, listen to me, you don't know him like that. So when I say prayer changes things, it's not just coming and falling on your face, but when he speaks to you, obey his voice and follow him and, and and here's the crazy thing I like this I like this because somebody in here is saying ain't nobody praying for me like that well maybe you've been thinking I've been talking about a literal person the whole time here's what Romans 8 and 26 says the spirit himself intercedes for you with groans I wish I had
head, somebody in here, and utterings that word cannot express. Here's what that means. God praying to God on my behalf for my deliverance. You mean to tell me a devil can get me if God is praying for me? Are you hearing me? The Spirit himself intercedes. The reason you're here is because God prayed for you. The reason you're here is because he interceded on your behalf. Are you with me? And here's where he resides, in the lives of the occupants of his church. So when the saints open their mouths to pray, it is God speaking through them to God on your behalf. Lord, have mercy. Tell me he ain't going to hear. Are you guys getting this? There is power in prayer. My prayer today, and I'm done, is that if there's somebody here who have been wrestling and have not said yes to God and don't know the truth of what God can do. Ellis Ministers, fill the eyes. Come on, we talked about this this morning. And don't know what God could do. Let's all stand to our feet. Come on. I want you to hear me say that God is able. I want you to hear me say that God can deliver. That God can heal. That God can make a difference. So wherever you find yourself this morning, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is here to heal. Is there one today that have been going through some things? Maybe you haven't given your life to God. Maybe you haven't been saying yes to God. Those elders, ministers, and deacons are lying in the aisles. They can see you. You can see them. All you got to do is establish on contact, contact. Look at one of them. Say, come pray with me. Come meet me. They're there for you. They'll bring you out. They'll bring you out. Wherever you find yourself. If it's salvation, if it's rededication, I need to rededicate my life to God. I need to get a fresh start. I need to do this all over again. Maybe I've been struck. Maybe I've been in prison. I'm saying metaphors, metaphors. Something has me captive. Something has me bound. They're there with you. Don't let them stand there by themselves. Go to them. Go to them. Let them pray with you. Let them minister. Let them minister. And if God is saying, come, they'll walk with you. They'll walk with you. They'll walk with you. They'll walk with you. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Amen. Move in this place. Move in this place, God. There's power in these seats, God. There's power here. Your presence is here. You can heal. You can deliver. You can restore. You can change. Holy Spirit, do it, God. Do it as only you can do it. So should there be one that don't know you, draw them to our relationship, Lord. Draw them to what God can do to them. Draw them, God. Draw them, draw them, draw them, draw them. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the fact that prayer changes things, that there's power in prayer. There's effectiveness in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous is powerful, God, and it's effective. So we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for... What you've done is your word has gone forth. God, continue to move in this place. Heal, restore, God. If there's another one sitting here thinking, man, that's me. I've been obedient. I've been sitting in my situation when I should have gotten up and walked it out. God, bring them to a relationship. Bring them, bring them, bring them, bring them, Lord. Do it as only you can do it. So I thank you for you. I thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for who you are. Move in this place, Lord. Move in this place. Move in this place. If God is speaking, come in your name. Amen.